Good afternoon in Johannesburg, South Africa. Good afternoon in most of Africa. And good morning to those in the United States of America. Um, welcome to the African Energy Chamber Outlook 2021 Outlook Lunch. Um, we are honored to have so many of you in the media engage with us on this brilliant, brilliant outlook on where we see Africa in 2021. And I just want to thank you for attending this lunch. And I also want to thank um, our distinguished, distinguished advisory board from my friend and brother, Nicola Bonifer, uh, my big sister, Nosiwe, and uh, they're fighting uh, um, Jude Kearney and Mikhail and also Katie Hurst from Africa Oil and Power and Verna on this. 2020 has been something of a tsunami to not just the oil and gas industry, but the African energy, um, the, Afri the African continent as a whole. And the African Energy Chamber, as we had moved with a lot of new initiatives, and we felt it was really important to react to the COVID crisis. It was really important to not just scream when, when you had the oil markets going down and not coming on well. It meant that we had to really come up with some initiatives that will drive um, the sector and keep it back. Why do we do what we do? For everyday African families, these are what it's really important to them. For every um, investor putting money in the energy sector, they are job drivers and drivers of economic growth. So it is very important that we stand with them and work with them and really ensure that we have this industry stay stable. This outlook outlines a clear picture bullish at some points, bearish at some points, but very, very strong facts. And sometimes facts can be very stubborn. And being stubborn in the fact that it also not is, comes as a warning as to where the continent and what the continent would see in 2021. But it's also a rallying call for us to decide on how policymakers and the energy industry are going to address some of the challenges. It talks a lot about in, Saudi, Saudi, in the Southern African basin, where there's been very, it's been very frontier and very little exploration has happened over many, many years. Now you got total with great discoveries. How do we meet a regulatory framework that meets and helps with whether it is gas monetization? With all the success that the chamber has done, we, it's easy to take a pat in the back and say, you know, you know what, let's stop there. We are not going to stop there. In 2021, we are going to focus to do more work on energy transition, more work on gas monetization, and more work on really addressing issues like the fiscal framework that we think are really going to address Africa's core, core challenges. Because competition today in the natural resource industry it's not just for Africans um, competing among Africans, but Africans competing with Guyana, competing with Suriname, competing with Brazil, with Mexico, and making sure that our licensing rounds and bidding rounds are successful, but also paving that way for an energy transition that is indeed African and meet African objectives and deal with African issues like energy poverty, which is very close and near, near and dear to the chamber. Dealing with issues of local content, we cannot forget that the African has always been the last hired and the first fired in the industry. In 2021, we're going to drive that agenda and we're going to drive it hard, but we have to be pragmatic to create a space for those that invest, that may not be seen as the enemy of, uh, um, of everyday Africans, but they've been embraced and they've been worked with. But dealing with also difficult regulatory environments that for a while have created, like the CEMAC regulations that we call a job killer and investment killer regulations. They are really, those kind of regulations really drive out. And at a time when we have in the Africa Free Trade Act, 
at a time when we're dealing with COVID-19 um, recovery, it is very important that regulators, governments, do meet business, do meet the energy sector halfway in getting an enabling environment so that we all can be successful. Because success of the energy industry means success of everyday people who need jobs and who want to be successful in our continent. These pro-growth strategies are going to, and I think that's what this, uh, this outlook really is, is really going to have some one of the biggest impact. I've never seen an outlook with, with such a big impact like what this, um, um, the African Energy Chambers outlook is already having and with a lot of attention that we're seeing right now. So I think we're on the right path. We have given the industry a roadmap for the future. We have also outlined it. We've done the job for everybody and for all those in the media, we are not charging you for what we've given you to write about over the coming, over the coming few days. But also looking at Africa as we go forward, we must not forget that issues around individual freedom, issues around human rights, issues around women's rights must also be put at the forefront in 2021 as the energy industry move, in, move, move, move forward. So I thank you guys so much. We have uh, all the smart people on the panel that will take all your intelligent questions. And uh, if you have not paid, maybe someday you could write the energy chain by check. I could give you the accounts when you need it. But uh, thank you for everything. And we look forward to working with you and really making sure that you in the media are a big part of what we do. The media, the role of the media and really getting accurate, um, um, an accurate perception of the oil industry, it's key. Whether when we are bullish, whether when we bearish, whether when the industry takes a hit, the media has a great role to play in informing our public to make sure this really works. So as I pass you over to the smart people and the really intelligent people who have, for all what they have, they have always volunteered to have that discussion with us. So I thank you so much. And I thank Jude, I thank Osiwe, I thank Petit Macron, Mikhail, and Nicola, and Bernard, and Katie. Thank you so much for hosting this event. And we hereby officially launch the 2021 outlook of the, uh, of the African Energy Chamber. Thank you so much. Thank you, NJ, very well said. Um, like NJ said, thank you so much for joining us um, today to the media. Um, and thank you to our um, esteemed guests who are going to be talking about these important um, issues um, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so welcome everyone to the official launch of the African Energy Outlook 2021. We are very excited to have you all with us. Um, this is the latest outlook from the African Energy Chamber. If you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to do so. Um, it is filled with um, incredible insights. Um, but more than just analyzing the current state of affairs, the 2021 outlook um, looks at major trends affecting the future of the African energy, energy industry and attempts to forecast its major developments. Um, that will shape the near future. Um, here with us today, as NJ said, we have Nicholas Bonifoy, um, partner of Asafo as & Co, um, joining us from London. Nosizwe Nokwe Makoma, the executive chairman and founder of Raise Africa Investments, joining us from Johannesburg. And Jude Kearney, president of Kearney Africa, joining us from Washington, DC. Um, Jude, thanks for waking up early today. Um, as we start this conversation for all our journalists, please note there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you can um, start submitting your questions in that Q&A box, we'll be getting to those at the end of our discussion, um, but you can go ahead and be submitting them as you think of them. Um, and so now we'll get started with our, our conversation. We're going to be hearing from our advisory board members and who are gonna bring their own perspectives to some of these topics. Um, so Nicholas, I'd like to start with you if we can. Um, the Chamber believe, believes that better fiscal terms could unlock an additional $100 billion by 2030 and support an additional production of 1 million barrels per day. Um, what does it say about the attractiveness of African markets from a regulatory perspective, and what is your overall take on how competitive the continent is for investment? Thank you. Many thanks, Katie and uh, NJ. I'm delighted to be on board the African Energy Chamber and uh, be involved in the regulatory affairs and this uh, particular uh, call uh, this morning. 
um, I, I would like to, to address two of the main features of the current environment as an introduction to this panel, and namely the low appetite for investment and the significant competition to attract this investment. The, the current environment in the oil and gas industry is very challenging as the appetite for investment in the oil and gas industry is currently quite low. This is not specific to Africa. The overall oil and gas industry is indeed going through a combination of three major crises. The first one is a structural oil and gas overproduction, which is triggering historically low prices across the board. The second one is a devastating coronavirus pandemic, which is triggering significant business disruption. And the last one, an enhanced momentum, but more importantly, increased pressure for the energy transition, which is driving investors away from hydrocarbons. As a result, oil and gas companies have significantly reduced their exploration and production budgets in Africa and are struggling to raise finance and attract investors for their hydrocarbons projects. Producing states in Africa are therefore in turn struggling to continue to attract investors for the exploration, development and production of hydrocarbons. And this is quite a paradox in a world which depends and relies so much on hydrocarbons, but that is definitely a feature of our current business environment. The second feature is, in my opinion, the increased competition between petroleum states. The business globalization, which has accelerated since the early 2000s, has led oil and gas companies to invest worldwide, not in a particular country or even a region anymore. And as a result, African legislators and regulators have had to compete with a growing number of countries in the world to attract investment, which has not necessarily increased over the years, quite the contrary, actually. Therefore, competition is quite fierce. At the moment, petroleum regimes in Africa are what I would say a mixed bag. And they do not always sit at the top of the list in terms of where oil and gas companies are keen to invest first while some African states have shown their ability to reassess their petroleum regime on a regular basis and to adjust to change in order to remain competitive, other African states unfortunately have failed to do so and therefore either do not attract as much investment as they should or even worse, deter investment. In this context, it is absolutely critical in my opinion to ensure that petroleum regimes in Africa remain as competitive as possible. In the first place, the petroleum regime should strike the right balance between the need to continue to attract investment on the one hand and the need to secure the best legal and commercial deal on the other hand, without prejudice to the critical environment, social, local content and governance concerns. In the second place, the balance of petroleum regimes should be reassessed on a regular basis and adjusted as necessary. And last but not necessarily the least, adjustments should be implemented in a time frame that is consistent with business requirements, not in several years from now when the legislative process has eventually managed to land somewhere, whereas the balance has already moved somewhere else. So, just, just a couple of ideas as food for thoughts in, in this introduction, and I would welcome the opportunity to uh, address some of your questions at a later stage. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, I, I think the, you know, the bringing up the global competitiveness is, uh, well, it really indeed the global competitiveness and the global market as a whole is so important, um, which brings us to our next um, question, Nosizwe, um, this is for you. So we're, the chamber anticipates in the outlook depressed gas prices and a sustained global LNG supply glut to drive gas monetization projects in Africa. Um, where do you expect most future gas developments on the continent from an upstream, midstream and downstream perspective? <clears throat> Thank you. Good um, <clears throat> afternoon and good morning to all the participants. Um, just to carry on from um, <clears throat> my colleague, 
In terms of the uh, global market, as we know, even before COVID struck, um, already the global market, the gas market was already facing, you know, uh, challenges. And that was resulting in depleted pricing. So what this led to eventually is that we had um, last year, there were double digit um, uh, FID projects in the double digits. And eventually um, only one of those um, FID projects was actually, um, was actually um, met FID. So what that tells you is that um, currently, even though it looks as if um, there might be a really serious challenge in terms of the projects and also riding on some of the factors that um, Nicolas spoke about, there are opportunities on the African continent where we see or where I, um, through analysis, when we look at where are the big projects, the top six gas projects uh, in Africa, of those, three of them are in East Africa, or should we say East Southern Africa, which is in Mozambique, and the other three are in, um, uh, are in West Africa. The interesting thing here is that when you look at what is happening now in terms of the transition and where investment is starting to move to um, uh, in the oil and gas uh, arena, um, the oil projects, Traditionally, we were an oil producing continent, and that is starting to shift now to becoming a gas producing continent. So the oil projects only comprise about a quarter of, um, of the prospective gas projects that we're looking at that should come on stream, let's say from 2021 to 2025. All of them are different levels of development. Some of them are waiting FID, and some of them are waiting um, some of them already have FID, the project in Mozambique, I mentioned, already um, completed FID in 2019. So we're seeing that there is a, 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 a move to actually concentrate on gas projects on the African continent. If you look at who is actually um, driving these projects, you'll find that it's the multinationals, even, even um, um, on the African continent, as it were. And there is um, a huge opportunity for the continuance of these projects because um, the Mozambican projects, for example, there are three of them, quite massive projects, which um, if uh, they do, the other two uh, do um, reach FID, they are going to unlock huge opportunities in terms of um, um, gas market exports, but Given the fact that we have this glut, it then brings an opportunity for the African continent to have regional markets, regional collaboration, um, so that um, we, can, we can develop a regional market on the continent. So I think there is um, what Nicolas spoke about earlier in terms of the fiscal regimes, in terms of the regulatory regimes. There is huge opportunity right now for the African um, leaders in the African continent to participate, to collaborate in terms of ensuring that as we move towards the realization of these projects in East Africa, in West Africa, we're able to create a, a bigger regional market in, in order to monetize the gas within the continent. So issues like um, industrialization of a lot of the countries that really require that, issues of gas to power, um, and also, um, which I think my colleague will speak to later, um, are becoming very, very pertinent opportunities that need to be taken upon. And I think I'll just stop there. Um, and later on in the Q&A, we can go into details about the different projects and um, the, the, the prognosis of those projects. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Nosizwe. Um, and I think we had just a couple of people join late. So I just want to reiterate, if you have a question, um, we'll be taking those at the end. So go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. Um, and if you can include your name and, and what um, publication you're from as well, that would be great. Um, so Jude, we're on to you. 
Um, the chamber reiterates the necessity to fight energy poverty and bring power to hundreds of millions of Africans still living in the dark. How do you expect the energy transition to affect the energy mix in Africa? And what place do you see for gas to power in the African energy transition? And Jude, you're, you're on mute. <clears throat> Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm getting flashes that my internet is, uh, is not overly strong, so please bear with me uh, if, uh, if for whatever reason I go out, but I will continue uh, to, uh, to comment. Uh, first of all, I want to do something, and I don't want people to think that this is an effort to sing for my supper, but um, we're having momentous discussions here in this, uh, in this, and this discussion will be replicated both in public squares and, and, and privately throughout Africa. But uh, it's made possible and it's, and it's enhanced really uh, by something that Africa really never had before, or actually the, 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 the globe never had before, and that is a credible Africa chamber, energy chamber. This is such a phenomenal idea and, and such a great platform uh, to address something that's on the precipice of significant change. NJ Ayuk sent me a text, uh, text message uh, three and a half years ago, literally, uh, and said, you know, I'm thinking of starting uh, an Africa energy chamber. What do you think? Um, and I don't remember thinking, wow, that's, that's ambitious, uh, but uh, there's nothing like it. Uh, and uh, I gave my support, uh, my, for what it was worth, I certainly gave my support and I thought that, you know, it would chug along and, you know, eventually become relevant. It became immediately relevant. And that is because uh, as energy goes on the African continent, so goes the African continent. Here, so with regards to the uh, issue that Katie raises on the impact of, uh, of various factors, including energy transition, on realizing the goal of A, uh, energy access, uh, and the full realization of, uh, of uh, uh, equity uh, in, for Africans in the energy, in the energy uh, context. Clearly, there are some impacts. Uh, energy transition has the, has the possibility, at least, uh, of uh, making some potential investors, if they're focused on, for instance, liquid petroleum, uh, and they believe that you know, African regimes are beginning mostly to focus on uh, non-liquid uh, petroleum, um, you know, they will have to wonder whether or not uh, their investment dollars are well spent. Um, so it's really incumbent on African governments to uh, make sure uh, that while they are cognizant of the importance of transition, they also don't leave any of their resources left to fallow. Uh, you know, clearly there's a role for liquid petroleum uh, for many more decades, uh, and it would be highly unfair uh, for Africa suddenly to be told to turn off its spigots while everyone else has so thoroughly utilized that liquid petroleum in their own um, on their own continents. So we have to figure out a way, A, to honor uh, and, and, and enhance and advance uh, transition, uh, while at the same time uh, utilizing the resources that are available for creating greater equity uh, uh, for Africans, uh, in, you know, utilizing all of its resources, including its liquid resources. Likewise, uh, we have to make sure, and Nicola did a phenomenal job, by the way, in talking about the, the role of of regulations and, and the role of, of regulating. Um, African governments likewise have to make sure uh, that while they uh, regulate in a way that is somewhat uniform so that investors can make you know, uh, good decisions about where to put its dollars and, and put, its, uh, put its resources, uh, they also don't uh, regulate in such a way that they are uh, foreclosing the opportunities for local content, for instance, uh, the foreclosing opportunity for greater um, access to energy uh, uh, and, and power uh, by, the, by the local populations, uh, and that they don't regulate in such a way uh, that all of the benefit uh, from the use of, of its resources go offshore. 
So uh, there are just a number of things I think that uh, that decision makers in, in Africa, uh, you know, have to be focused on, have to be, um, you know, cognizant of, and, you know, try and, and, and achieve a number of things at one time. You know, one of the things I love about my decision 25 years ago to work exclusively in Africa is that I began seeing in the early uh, uh, 90s when I was doing significant work on the continent on behalf of the U.S. Department of Commerce, I began seeing that contrary to what you, uh, the picture you got of Africa in most Western media, uh, Africa was no longer willing to hide its bushel under a basket, uh, which is a common phrase here, meaning hiding its, its capacity, its goods, its, its uh, total you know, ability uh, you know, uh, under a screen. They were beginning to come out and show, A, uh, their great interest in partnership with, uh, with the outside investing world and with their bilateral partners, but they were also showing tremendous capacity uh, on the ground uh, to uh, participate in the, uh, in, in the industrialization of, of Africa and the economic development of Africa. That will go a long way, in addition to making sure that you, know, you have good and relevant uh, regulation and, and, and uh, you know, balance uh, the needs to produce you know, all of your resources. This idea that Africans are, are equal partners and, and incredibly capable as partners uh, in your investment uh, on the continent is also very, very important. Uh, I have come to know, you know, some of the smartest people in industries are Africans, uh, both in the legal industry. Nicolas, uh, uh, the founder of his firm, uh, is a very close friend of mine, one of the smartest lawyers I know. Uh, you know, he's, he's a uh, native West African. Uh, and uh, uh, Nigeria, has some of the smartest uh, petroleum engineers and, and entrepreneurs in the world. So all of these things come together, thankfully, uh, to increase uh, the comfort and confidence that an investor should have in investing in Africa as opposed to some other places. Clearly COVID and other, you know, uh, a diminished uh, commodity price will have its impact but it shouldn't have its impact unduly on Africa as opposed to uh, you know, a, a broader range of possible investment scenarios. The truth of the matter is Africa is less complicated than some other markets uh, so that once you know, the conditions exist again uh, for aggressive uh, and thorough uh, investment and partnership, I think Africa will be standing first in line and it's you know, finding new resources really on a monthly basis. Uh, so there's great opportunity here uh, in Africa there. I think of myself as an African, so I'm constantly saying here, even though I'm sitting in Washington, there's great opportunity there and great security uh, for, for, invest, for investors who know uh, what, it, what it is they're looking for and how to go about it. Uh, I am bullish on, on Africa's future and its, and its energy sectors. Uh, and, uh, you know, I will continue to do my part in supporting both the chamber, uh, but also industry uh, in Africa. So, Katie, I hope that helps. It does, of course. Thank you, Jude. <clears throat> so we're just going to quickly take um, a minute for each um, of the advisory board members to, you know, either comment on something from the outlook that really struck you um, or to respond to something one of your, um, one of your fellow panelists said. Um, but Due to you know, due to time constraints and to to get to the media questions, really try to keep this pretty brief, thirty seconds to a minute, Nicholas. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think we should uh, continue to 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 talk uh, for too much longer. We very much welcome the opportunity to address the questions that the the, the media will ask. But um, I could not emphasize more the 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 importance of individuals individual skills. In that, that Africa has to offer, and uh, that goes much beyond the uh, the tremendous resources in terms of minerals and hydrocarbons. And uh, this is where we have to continue to focus our energy because this is from 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 that point on that uh, we will uh, manage to thrive success. Perfect. No seas way. So. 
You know, um, I think one of the things that I take from what Jude is saying is that given the fact that, you know, um, we have all these skills on the continent, we've got the prognosis that's looking good for the, um, for the project. I mean, if you look at the, the issue, I think I spoke earlier about some of the projects which had been deferred, but those um, are, pro you know, are, are projected to come on board within the next, let's say, 20, up to 2025, 2026. And I think what's important is that we need to also not forget the issue of how these projects are going to be able to unleash that which a lot of countries on the continent are, uh, are working towards, which is the local content aspect. I mentioned that uh, the projects are run by the multinational companies, but we mustn't forget the advantages and the opportunities that this type of spend is going to bring for local continent on, you know, I mean, local content on the continent going through. So even though there's doom and gloom all over, uh, you know, uh, globally, there is an opportunity to make all of these things work for, you know, the, the, the countries, local content, opening up the economy, and those things I think should not be forgotten as we continue with the discussion. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Jude, and just like I said, like about 30 seconds, and um, we're getting so many great questions, I'm excited to get into them. And you're on, you're on mute again. Sorry, I peeked at a couple of the questions myself, so I can't wait to, get, to dig into those. But, but, you know, I just want to really emphasize uh, uh, both what, what uh, Nicola focused on in terms of talent. Uh, and it, that dovetails NJ, Mikael, Werner, and Katie with this concept of local content. Local content is meaningless if there's no one on the ground who's really capable of carrying the ball. The truth of the matter is there are tremendous numbers of people on the ground willing and capable to carry the ball. We have to be smart about local content and we have to make sure that uh, investors are, are not, you know, getting mixed messages, but I fully commend the concept of local content. Perfect. Um, so let's get into these questions. So um, some of them are directed to specific um, panelists and some of them are a little bit more broad. Um, this one, our very first question was from Vladimir um, from Routers in Moscow. Um, he says, Russia last year hosted an Africa summit for the first time. Do you think that Russia has chances to strengthen its foothold in Africa's oil and gas, in Africa's oil and gas sector in 2021 and beyond and be a strong rival to China in the region? Um, since it's not addressed to a particular person, is there someone who wants to tackle this one? I see, NJ. I think we all want to. Tackle. <laughs> I would take it. Um, I was lucky to be um, invited to the Russia Africa Summit last year, and I think it was a great summit. Like most of these summits are, a lot of promises, but you have to really get into to you know. In these summits, you, you, you get a lot of poetry and promises, but um, the pros of it has really not happened. There has been some, a lot of MOUs. I think Russian companies are known in Africa as the country of MOUs, and those MOUs get signed, and a lot of PhDs get um, happen signing those MOUs, but Africa is yet to see some PhDs in, execute, in executing those, those MOUs. Um, Gazprom, Rosneft, and I would even say Zarubashnev and others have really had a chance to make an impact. They have not. There is still, the jury is still out on them. They have to do more. Luke Oil um, recently tried in uh, Senegal. I think that's still ongoing, but they would, would side you see its uh, preemption rights to move on that. But I think the idea that Russian companies cannot compete or play in Africa, it's not, um, it, it, it's not true. They can do more. Rush Geo in Equatorial Guinea has done a phenomenal job with, with some of the seismic acquisition. But I think Russian companies have to do more to really get involved and not just see Africa from a trading standpoint, I think, like I always say, Africans want to get married, Russians just want to date. And I think if you change that attitude, you're going to see a lot more, but on the substance, 
you've not really seen so, a lot of deals being closed compared to whether it is China or European or US companies. You can say whatever you want about US companies or, or Chinese or my European brothers. They do close deals. They keep trying every day. And for us, we want to see transactions. We want to see deals being closed. We want to see people get, get integrated in actually executing some of these, these agreements. And I think the jury is still out on Russia, Africa. I think what was discussed in Sochi, COVID cannot be used as an excuse from them, not re from them signing MOUs and not executing. I think people are a little bit tired of, of that. I think there is love for Russia in Africa. You go into Mozambique, you go into um, Equatorial Guinea, you go into Nigeria, there is a lot of love. And, you know, Nosiwe right here, she has so much love for the Soviet Union. And she would tell you about her time in, uh, I think, Kazakhstan and everything. She probably had, a, um, she, I, bet, I think she's gotten, up, gotten over the Akroshka and the Pilminis. And right now she wants to see the dollars coming into Africa. Perfect. Thank you, NJ. Um, we do have several more questions. Too. Say again. And the vodka too. <laughs> uh, the vodka. Always the vodka. Um, we do have several more questions, so I think I'm going to keep going. Um, unless this is where you wanted to add something um, to that question. Okay. Um, so this is a question for Jude, and actually I think this is a question the whole world is asking right now. Um, what will the election of Joe Biden change for global energy markets and for the energy cooperation between Africa and the U.S.? So, Jude, good luck with that question. <laughs> well, I will tell you, first of all, uh, we will have someone sitting in the Oval Office who doesn't think of uh, Africa as uh, a, a collection of shithole countries. Uh, and that is a big, big first step. Uh, you know, uh, Joe made a, a comment at the end of the last debate, uh, which was really taken out of context. You know, he said something to the effect of, you know, putting uh, energy in its place or something like that. And I think he was focused on, you know, uh, fracking in particular uh, in the U.S. Uh, but I have known Joe, uh, you know, myself for a number of years, having, having met him when I first came to Washington uh, when he was in the Senate. Um, and I am absolutely convinced uh, that um, A, because of his own goodwill towards Africa, and B, because of the existence of a, a uh, uh, vice president who uh, has a natural affinity for Africa, the relationship will take off. In fact, what I think it will do uh, is eclipse uh, the last real strong bonding uh, between uh, the U.S. government in Africa, and that was under Bill Clinton. Um, certainly Obama did his part as well, uh, but he felt constrained uh, not to give too much, uh, you know, too much uh, fodder to, to the media by, by favoring Africa. Uh, Bill Clinton favored Africa very, very much. Uh, and I think this new administration will as well. Um, they have a number of people within their administration who, uh, who have worked in Africa, uh, and I will work closely with them. So there will be new opportunities uh, to um, get um, both grant resources as well as uh, development funding uh, and, and just partnership uh, with this new administration. So I'm looking for a thousand percent increase uh, in the goodness between the U.S. and Africa as a result of this new administration. Great. Um, and then moving on to Nosizwe, um, South Africa has been talking for years about adopting gas at larger scale. What concrete gas projects do you see taking shape in the country for 2021? So um, I think that's, that's a correct question. I mean, the debate has been on. Uh, for a while. Um, now the uh, uh, Petroleum Resources um, Development Bill has been published and it went out for public comment. And uh, one of the things that um, we see already happening is that the Kuha Special Economic Zone has been declared as a special economic zone 
and there, there is going to be um, an LNG import terminal, which is going to be uh, built in Kuha. And basically, maybe what I should say a little bit more about the bill is that that bill that I mentioned earlier, it aims to attract investment in, into LNG um, imports to increase the uh, exploration, create a domestic gas feedstock and diversify the energy mix. So effectively, by, um, by uh, declaring the uh, SEZ as an import terminal uh, for, for, for gas, that's already uh, a part of the implementation of some of those plans. And in fact, I think as we speak right now, one of the power generation plants, which is in the south of Cape Town, uh, called Ankerlik, it used to be a diesel, uh, diesel powered um, plant. It's for, uh, it's for peak. It's not, it's not your, your base uh, generating plant, it's a peak plant. It's currently being converted so that it can be uh, gas fired. So there is um, a move in terms of looking at the bill and looking at the uh, integrated resource plan and trying now to start implementing uh, some of the um, projects. And I think around about in 2021, once we've seen the, the outcome of the commentary and some of the implications, in fact, the, uh, the, the, sorry, some of the um, implementation, the Minister of uh, Minerals and Energy has been very bullish about moving this bill ahead and also ensuring that um, they can attract investment. I think the, um, the total discovery, um, the two uh, wells that were drilled successfully by Total is really bringing added interest now into South Africa. And I think we should start seeing some um, positive um, uh, spin-offs from not only, the, not only the regulatory environment, which is the bill, but also the uh, interest in investment, uh, which I think is really being uh, catalyzed by the Total find. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, and we have a question from Ed Reed um, from Energy Voice. Um, to what extent are African states ready to tap export markets' desire for energy transition? Um, he gives, you know, for example, hydrogen, blue or green exports, or carbon neutral LNG. Um, again, this is not addressed to a particular panelist. Is there someone who wants to take this question on? Yes, perhaps as, a, as an introduction to the, um, to, to the answer. I would say that I don't think that any African state in particular has anything against the energy transition. A lot of them have already embraced the energy transition to make sure they provide their own contribution. And there's some places that are very well known in Southern Africa or in East Africa for that, some others in, in, uh, in, in North Africa. But we, we have to understand that a lot of others are actually finally going to enjoy the, the, the living standards and the comfort that have hydrocarbons have brought to other developed economies in the world uh, over the past century. And therefore, we're going to have to, to balance their, 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 their willingness to finally reach this comfort, uh, thanks to hydrocarbons, and the their, their, their necessity for the, for the world to move forward with the energy transition. And that, that's, that's that, the whole ambiguity of the answer of, of Africa towards the energy transition. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Katie, me just uh, following up on some of what Nicola was saying, and that is pretty much just to say that yes, Africa is uh, pro energy transition. From what we see, you know, speaking to uh, a whole host of governments, but it is very important to say that the sentiment is that energy transition in Africa has to happen on an African pace. So it is very unlikely that we will see acceptance for a European or an American pace of energy transition in Africa. And so what we are saying, or what a lot of Africans, uh, 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 African governments are saying, uh, that if we do at this particular moment have resources which are oil uh, or which are some other hydrocarbon in that sense, and that we can be able to power our own development with those resources in a cost-effective and efficient way, uh, more than at, the, at this particular moment using uh, newer technologies and all of that, then certainly that would still be significantly relied on by African governments. It's not just a question of transition for Africa, it's also a question of access to energy 
access to energy is a significant issue for Africans and also affordability of energy is significant. And so it's not just about putting solar uh, in Africa, but it has to be affordable. It has to be able to compete with other hydrocarbons or other sources of energy. Uh, and so that is certainly something which the global discourse on energy transition has to take into consideration. I mean, if you see what the banks are doing in terms of moving to not more sanction uh, projects because those are carbon heavy projects, one has to ask themselves, if at all, an African country which significantly needs power and can use carbon uh, resources to generate that power but cannot uh, source the financing for those particular projects, it becomes a significant problem for those African countries. And so that is what we hear when we talk to uh, governments on the continent, and that is certainly something that has to feed into the global discussion on energy transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Werner, I'm going to direct this one to you as well. So um, we have a question from Angelo from CGTN, um, looking for an honest assessment of the impact of the insurgency in Cabo Delgado on the gas projects in Mozambique. Um, so Werner, if you can address that one as well. Yes, uh, thank you, Angelo. Thank you very much. This is uh, pretty much a question which is a lot of, uh, on a lot of minds because we're seeing uh, billions and billions of dollars which are scheduled to go into Mozambique and Mozambique gas uh, uh, developments. And a lot of people are asking themselves if at all that is going to be in jeopardy. The simple answer is no. Yes, there is uh, 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 an insecurity problem in Cabo Delgado. Yes, the government has not fully, totally taken care of it. I think a lot of people expect the government to turn a switch and all the problem is over. There is certainly an insecurity problem in Cabo Delgado. The government has thrown a lot of resources at it, but that particular area is huge. And so you're likely to always see some kind of insecurity around that. Uh, a lot of those projects are offshore, meaning that they're unlikely to be in the target range of any kind of insurgency. But fundamentally, when, when, when we look at those problems and in our discussions with the government, a lot of those are also based on economic grievances, the absence of opportunity in a lot of those places. And so the hope is here that as we see some of that investment go into Mozambique, that the government and, and energy companies can create the kinds of opportunities that slowly suck out the energy from the insurgency. So just to cut it short and to say, Yes, we are going to continue seeing reports in the short term about the insurgency in Cabo Delgado. Unfortunately, it's unable, no government will be unable to police uh, uh, all of that area. No is the simple answer. It's not going to stop investment moving into those projects. And uh, over time, my projection, our projection from a lot of what we've seen, including what we've seen in other conflict areas in Africa is that as we see more of those local populations get involved, and that is really the hope here, get involved in some of these projects and some of the spin-offs that are going to come off these projects, we are likely to see a significant reduction in the violence and pretty much a, more, a, a greater focus on the investments and on the development that is happening on the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, our next question is from John, writing from the Global Trade Review in London. Um, in the last few months, we've heard a lot about energy trading companies struggling to access trade finance, particularly in Asia and the Middle East. Are you finding that energy traders in Africa have reliable access to bank financing despite the difficulties of the last few months? Um, is there somebody who wants to tackle this question? Um, Nicholas. <laughs> I'll, I'll comment. I'll comment. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of project finance on the on the continent in Africa, so uh, I'm constantly, generally aware of where funding is is either readily available or not. Banks play a substantial role in two markets uh, with regards to uh, maybe three markets with regards to energy uh, investment. 
um, and uh, and that's mostly in South Africa, Nigeria, and uh, and Kenya. Um, but but all of those uh, you know private banking institutions, even in those three countries, uh, you know, are becoming increasingly wary of uh, of funding investments uh, in in the energy sector simply because of the diminution in the price of commodities. So they're not assured of getting, you know, repaid their investment. So there's difficulty, um, but it can be overcome. You know, the, the whole purpose of project financing is to structure uh, the, the, the lending in such a way so that the benefit to them, the security to them, isn't the, you know, um, isn't the, um, uh, the, the actors who are coming to them for, for, for funding. It is the existence of the uh, product itself. So if they take an outsized uh, interest in the product itself to overcompensate themselves sometimes uh, in the case of, of default, uh, they become much more interested. So it's, uh, it's really important if you're going to look for funding from the private sector uh, to, to be you know, very smart about ways to project finance it in a way so that you don't leave the, uh, the lender uh, or the investor holding the bag. Great, thanks Jude. Um, and we actually, I think we have time for one more question and this is a good question to end on because it's a question for everybody. Um, so this will be kind of our wrap up question. Um, we have Nate um, with E&E &E News. Um, he says, my question is to the whole panel, are African governments in the continent's business community facing pressure from outside the continent to block or discourage investment in the African hydrocarbon, in African hydrocarbon resources for the sake of encouraging renewable energy development or climate mitigation? Um, Nusizwe, do you want to start us off with this one? Thanks, Katie. Um, I would say I don't. I don't think that. Um, Governments are under look are under extreme pressure. I think what what I would say is that governments recognize that there is a need for um, an energy transition. Right. Um, I think most of the government on the African continent. I'm not sure which countries have not, but by and large they would have signed all the global treaties that talk about you know climate change issues. I know South Africa has and also the issue about the you know, energy transition. But going back to what NJ said earlier, there is also a, a, a necessity to be realistic about where on the developmental continuum a lot of African uh, countries face and um, find themselves. So there has to be a very pragmatic approach in terms of how do we move along this continuum. For example, let's take South Africa as a good example. South Africa is is um, cold rich, cold rich, and right now possibly about ninety percent of the energy is produced from coal. So there has to be a transition. But the question is, how do you do that transition? How do you encourage the renewable energy development? And how do you actually do climate mitigation? One of the companies in South Africa, Sasol, has also embarked on a decarbonization because they happen to be one of the highest polluters. They've embarked on a decarbonization process where they actually have other projects that can um, mitigate their, you know, their, 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 their climate, the, the impact on climate. So yes, they are moving along the continuum, but as NJ said, at the pace that is the correct pace for the development of the country as it were. So the pressure is understood, but they also push back and they say, listen, this, these are the things that we have to deal with and allow us to deal with those things in our time. That would be my view. Great, Jude. Yeah, listen, I, I uh, agree with Nosizwe uh, very much. Um, there are uh, ideological organizations, Katie, uh, that certainly would stop uh, the production uh, and the use of, of most hydrocarbons having nothing to do with Africa per se, but generally, because they think that, you know, it has this sort of magic of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, enhancing and, and pushing, um, you know, sort of climate uh, remediation uh, immediately. 
those folks don't have a whole lot of control over whether or not investment will or will not go into uh, Africa. There are some institutions, on the other hand, that can have an impact uh, and, and who may have a negative impact on investment in the, in the sector, but not because that's their target. You know, the IMF and other sort of multilateral institutions are focused on trying to get actors, uh, government actors, to do a particular thing so that uh, that particular thing, uh, you know, may in some instances uh, sort of de-emphasize new investment in hydrocarbons or, or, or the like, but it's mostly for a structural purpose as opposed to an ideological purpose against uh, hydrocarbons. So uh, there are some things out there that could have some impact on you know, how robust governments will be on, on hydrocarbons, but I don't think uh, for most financial institutions, they are saying right now, well, you know, uh, we made a choice and we're not going to support hydrocarbons. Thank you, Jude. Nicholas. As far as I'm concerned, um, I do not believe that um, Africa will discourage any investment in the energy sector um, in Africa, whether it is renewable or not. Africa is not in a place where it is going to be picky about which energy uh, to put forward. Um, uh, the population of Africa is expected to grow fourfold over the next 80 years. The energy demand is expected to grow threefold just on the next 20 years that are coming. In the meantime, the energy production is not expected to grow for more than 50% over the next 20 years. This is going to leave a massive energy gap in Africa. Africa is not at a stage where it can happily think about how am I going to implement transition. The transition is an important matter, but this is not on the agenda yet. Every morning what Africa needs to do is to produce energy to feed people and to uh, foster economic development. So this, this, that doesn't mean that the energy transition is not important there, but they are not there yet. Very well said, Nicholas. Um, so we are about to close out the session. I just want to remind all our journalists that we have um, that the advisory board members, um, the, both all of the ones here on the, the video call and, um, and the other advisory board members are available for interviews. Um, so if you'd like to arrange an interview with, um, with a board member um, from the African Energy Chamber, please reach out to the chamber. Um, you'll find the contact information um, on their website and that's also, there's information in the chat box here if you wanna take a look. Um, and NJ, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to provide um, some brief concluding remarks. And Jay, you're on mute. Thanks, Jude. You know, I'm not very smart with all this IT stuff, but uh, I just really want to thank uh, Nicola, I want to diagnose this way, Jude, Mikhail, Katie, Werner, and the entire team at uh, the African Union Chamber for um, an amazing and truly historic work that has been done. Who would have known that three years later, this group of people and the chamber would be leading the path and really defining the future that is really going to be driven by those who are bold to invest, but also Africans who are willing to create the right kind of an urban environment to see that happen. As these challenges face all of us, we continue to believe that Africa is not going to be, Africa's oil and gas markets would not be saved by OPEC cuts or GECF's uh, partnerships, but with that growing demand that Nicola eloquently talked about in his last comments, that with more people, we have a firm belief with the right kind of policies, with low taxes and the right kind of fiscal terms, we can see an Africa that demand is going to grow so much like China and that demand when we are we're going to shape demand of the oil market of the future. So we just want to thank everybody from the media to continue communicating our challenges, our futures, but also hold us accountable because this industry, the oil and gas industry is only as good 
as the people who are in it. And it's in a changing environment where most people like us never dreamt about being in this industry. But we, we, today we are in leadership roles where we can really chart a new industry to be good as are the people that live in this continent, to be welcoming to all investors, but also to play its own global part in making sure that Africa's position in a world that calls for energy transition, that calls for empowerment of women, but that continues to attract investment in those key areas and that we don't fail on our obligations to lift every voice and let our spirits rise again for the Africa that we deserve. Thank you so much. And we look forward to having a great conversation with you in the future. But thank the media a lot for all that they have done to support the work of the chamber. Because without the media, I don't think our voices would have been heard and a different perspective would have been heard. And thank you so much for everything. And we really look forward to our relationship, our partnership with you. We think the media is an integral part of what we do. And even when some of your questions are not very smart, we still love them. So come on by and we'll keep talking. And uh, thank you for coming on board. Thank you. Thank here, you, everybody. Here. Have Thanks. a great day, Ed.